I did good last week. When? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I knew it wasn't about what I actually spoke about. It had to do with me letting you guys get out early. Okay, I hear you. I hear you. I'm not, I'm not hurt at all. Oh, well, if all you need is daylight, then as we get into the summer, we're going to be fine because I won't have to let you go till like 9 o'clock. All right, now it's time. Good evening, everybody. I hope everyone is doing well. I hope you've been, been enjoying your week. Uh, happy spring to you, our first service of the spring because spring was Monday, apparently. I didn't realize that until Monday afternoon, but, uh, but just so good to see all of y'all tonight, I've got a couple of quick announcements, and then we'll get into the offering and uh, get into the lesson tonight. A uh, couple of things we need to mention. First of all, ladies, don't forget that Sunday uh, evening at 5.30, you have your women's ministries virtual event. That's going to be over at the Life Center because y'all are going to eat because when we meet, we eat. And so you're going to be over at the Life Center at 5.30. And for you ladies who don't know, for the second year in a row... Oak Grove Women's Ministries won the $150 gift card. Is that what it? What, okay. The $150 gift card for the virtual event from the, that's from like national, right? From the national offices in Oklahoma. That's because we're a people of favor. Amen. So congratulations to you. So everybody gets a cut of that. Uh, no, I'm kidding. That's not the way that works. But uh, no, that's just to help with, uh, you know, just getting some things together. So I think there may be door prizes. I don't know. I'm, I'm talking about stuff I don't even know. I'm not invited. So I do want to mention, uh, and apparently it's just the ladies. So men don't get offended by this. But ladies, if you have a recipe that is like your signature dish, something that you, everybody wants to, you to make that and, oh, you know, I can't wait to to taste sister so-and-so's blah, 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 or whatever. My wife is compiling a recipe book. Well, I didn't know it was a secret. What did you say in the thing? Oh, my bad. Look, nobody's listening. Anyway, get your recipes of Crystal. All right, what else can I announce? Apparently, I can announce whatever I want. All right. Spring fleeing is coming up on April 1st. Is that a secret? Everybody knows that? All right. What about the egg hunt and the lunch on April 2nd? Does everybody know about that? Okay. See, I'm, I'm in trouble, guys. I mean, we may just go to prayer for the rest of the night. I had no idea anything was supposed to be a surprise. So, uh, anyway, we're going to have a lunch and an egg hunt on the 2nd of April. That'll be after service that Sunday. If you would like to donate candy for the egg hunt, uh, there's a bin out here that already has some wonderful looking candy that I have not taken home. And uh, you can drop that off, but you need to have that in there by next Wednesday so that we can get all the eggs crammed full of candy and get those children hyped up before we send them back home to their parents. But there are some other announcements in the bulletin. I'm not going to take the chance of announcing any more of them right now, uh, so we'll just let that go. If our usher would come at this time, we're going to receive uh, the tithe and offering this evening, and we appreciate you giving, and I know that the Lord is going to bless you as you give. And let's not forget about uh, those that are in need of prayer, those that are uh, have been sick and are struggling, those that are trying to get over different operations and and all of that and let's just be praying for uh for the new soul that was saved this past sunday that god will be with him and will strengthen him and uh got something out in the mail to him today and uh going to be trying to get in touch with him uh tomorrow and and just letting him know that we're praying for him and we're thinking about him and i don't know if you've noticed or not we've actually had quite a few guests that have been coming to our church uh quite a few people that uh they're coming more than once too I believe that the Lord is doing something, and we just need to pray that we're ready to receive whatever it is that God wants to pour into us. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together today. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all of your wonderful blessings. Lord, we want to thank you again for the soul that was saved this past Sunday. 
And Lord, we're believing that that's just a drop in the well of what we're about to see happen because of the move of your Holy Spirit. It's not because of us. It's not because of the music or the preaching or, or, or anything else, Lord, but it's because of our desire to serve you, our desire to be vessels of honor for you, God. And we just thank you, Lord, for all that you're doing in our church. I pray that you will touch every one of those in our, our church that is suffering with sickness or pain or, dis or, or anything else, Lord, financial problems or whatever it may be. Lord, that you will just touch them and minister to their needs in the name of Jesus. We pray, Father, as we give today, that you will bless it many times over. Lord, that you will bless the seed going in the ground, that a great harvest will come forth. And we give you praise and honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you as you give today. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn, first of all, to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. <clears throat> Excuse me. Hebrews, chapter 11. And we're going to read verses 30 and 31. And then, if you can put your thumb in it, over to Joshua, chapter 2. And there's quite a few verses in, in Joshua chapter 2 that I'm going to be talking about. Uh, I may not read them all, but just uh, kind of have your thumb there for reference. <coughs> Excuse me, and of course we'll have it on the screen as well. But it's always good to have your sword with you when, when you're coming into the service. Amen? Um, I know that I will refer to my Bible on my Bible app a lot. In fact, I've got one Bible app that I use for a lot of my study and all that but there's something about when you pull up the bible all of a sudden that's when a notification seems to come in you got an email that you got well what are they saying or a facebook notification well what do they want or something and next thing you know you're not even paying attention to what's going on because you've gotten sidetracked that's happened to me many times actually but there's just something about feeling the pages of the word amen uh but hebrews chapter 11 verses 30 and 31 by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were compassed about seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. Like I said, we're going to go over to Joshua chapter 2. I'm just going to read the first couple of verses and then we'll pause for a moment. Joshua chapter 2, verse 1, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of uh, Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither to night of the children of Israel to search out of uh, the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I, I wot not. Pers uh, pursued after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. I want to talk to you for just a little bit tonight about the harlot heroine because she has just been on my mind the past couple of days as I've been uh, praying and, and, and asking the Lord what he wanted me to speak about and I just couldn't get away from talking about Rahab. Now Rahab... Uh, there's not a whole lot talked about her in the Bible. Uh, as a matter of fact, the reference that we have in Hebrews, uh, to the best of my study, the reference that we have in Hebrews is the only place where she is mentioned in the New Testament, except for when we're talking about the lineage of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, what we need to understand here, and I, I don't want to skip ahead too much. Let me back up a little bit. Rahab was a, a woman, she was, she was a harlot in the city of Jericho. And these two men, which in, in Joshua chapter 2, it doesn't say which two men, but these two men went to the city, and somehow they came to the house of Rahab. And when they came to the house of Rahab, Rahab offered to save them and to rescue them and to keep them 
from the rest of the town, from the rest of the guards in the city, because, of course, they obviously would have been put to death if they had realized that there were spies that were in the city. Those spies were there because God had told them that they were going to give them the city of Jericho. God had told them that he was going to give them uh, this, this massive walled city and they were just going and scouting out to see what was what, to see if it, all the stories they had heard were true, to see all of those things. And so these men came in, and they just happened, and I love, I love coincidence with the Lord, amen, but they just happened to come to this woman's house. Now, here's what happened with Rahab. We've got to understand, Rahab was not saved, all right? First of all, nobody was saved back then this was before the crucifixion of jesus christ there were those that lived for god jehovah and then there was everybody else rahab was among the everybody else and she was not uh what we would consider a christian nowadays she was not a church person all right she was a harlot she sold herself for money that's what she was known for everybody knew who rahab was um and so uh, these men just happened to come to her house and Instead of her being like a lot of, of people are as far as, well, I'm going to do what's going to be best for me, and I'm going to try to get some money out of this, and I'm going to try to exploit this situation, and I'm going to blackmail them, or I'm going to turn them in, and then I'm going to get this great reward for saving the city and all this kind of stuff. She had heard stories of how God had taken the Israelites out of Egypt. As a matter of fact, later on, if you look and uh, you go to um, verse 9, of chapter 2 uh, where we just stopped and she said unto the men I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is fallen upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you for we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when ye came out of Egypt and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan Sihon and Og, whom ye utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. So here's what has happened in this situation. Rahab, who is not a believer, had never sacrificed an animal of, uh, for sin and forgiveness unto God. She wouldn't have even been allowed to because she was not a Jew. She was not a, an Israelite. She was not of the Hebrew children. But she had heard about their God. And because she had heard these stories, and because she had heard how, well, you know, the, the Israelites, the Hebrews were all over in Egypt, and they have been for hundreds of years, you know, over 430 years, they were in bondage in Egypt, and suddenly they all just left, and, and, and their God opened up the Red Sea, and they crossed over and then closed it back on their, uh, their uh, pursuers, the, the Egyptians that were coming after them. And then this happened, and then this happened, and then they conquered these people, and they did all these kinds of things, and all these stories came back to her. And she had never seen it for herself. But faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Rahab, although she was not raised in church, although she was not raised to serve Almighty God, although she was not raised in a way where, where she knew uh, scriptures or she knew uh, anything of, of God as far as uh, you know, uh, Adam and Eve and all this kind of thing, you know, she was raised in a place where they didn't even talk about that. They had other gods that they served and there were other gods that they, they worshipped. She was not put in that position, but she heard the stories of a God that she calls the Lord. She never said, she never said that God that you serve. I mean, she says, uh, she did say uh, at one point, hold on one second, where is it that says, uh, the Lord, uh, the Lord that you serve, where is it? Oh, uh, because of you for the Lord your God. She did say that. 
He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. She had never one time been to tabernacle. She had never one time heard a song of praise uh, sung unto the Lord. She was not there when, they, when the Lord opened up the Red Sea. She was not there to taste the manna that God provided. She was not there to see the swarm of quail that came in to provide meat for the children of Israel. She never once saw any of these things. She had never laid her eyes on the Ark of the Covenant that would go before the armies and they would have victory over their enemies she never saw it but she had heard about it and in her heart she believed now listen this is a message for us that we need to understand because here is a woman that she's facing death because she knows who these guys are she knows these guys have come in and they've come in to, to spy on the city they have come in to find out exactly where you know where the best entrances are exits are how many men do they have on the wall how thick is the wall that we're talking about you know what time do they shut the gates all these kinds of things that the army would need to know they have come in to scout it out so that they could prepare to destroy that city and destroy everybody in it but she had heard she had heard about the God that opened up the waters. She had heard about the God that had taken out Pharaoh. She had heard the stories of the plagues in Egypt of a man who came and said, let my people go. I've come here because I am has sent me. She heard those stories and in her heart she believed. Now, the reason why this is a lesson for us is because of the fact that we need to understand that all the excuses that we can give, well, I wasn't raised in church, so I don't live the same way everybody else does. Well, I've had a rough life, so I don't do the same. You know, I, that's why I do the things that I do. Or, well, it's been hard on me. You don't understand. You know, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. All those kinds of things, they're nothing but excuses that you have decided to put up instead of putting the effort towards learning who God is and growing closer to Him. Uh, Crystal and I were watching a documentary about uh, the Amber Alert and, and how it came about. And uh, a tragic, horrible story. We didn't realize actually how recent actually it's been. It, it was what, the mid-90s, 95, 98, something like that, is when it had happened. And we all know what the Amber Alert is. It'll come up on our phones and we're like, oh, you know, uh, I'm in the middle of doing something and, you know, whatever. But but this Amber Alert has saved countless numbers of, of children who have been abducted. But we were watching the, the documentary about the origin of how it came about. And what's interesting is this. Her parents, her, her mom and her dad, they weren't married. He was quite a bit older than her. But they were both right there when news came out that Amber had been abducted. And for those of you who don't know the story, this was a case of where... Um, she and her little brother had gone out bike riding and they went to this place where there was a, an abandoned parking lot and they were supposed to come back so he started to come back he was the younger brother and she said okay I'm coming I just want to do something real quick and so he just went and about the time he got to the house he realized that she wasn't riding behind him and his grandpa was in the the garage and he pulls into the driveway and and he says well where's your sister well she's over at the ramps and immediately they got in the truck and they went to this place just minutes and her bike was there but she wasn't anywhere to be found and what they didn't realize was at the same time that he was getting the the brother in the truck and was taking them to the parking lot a 911 call was coming in and a man had seen a black truck pull up to this little girl on a bicycle and get out grab her throw her in the truck and take off it all happened just like that so there was no question that she had been abducted. Excuse me, that she, she wasn't just missing, she didn't run away, she'd been abducted. So the mom and the dad are there. And they go through all this tragedy and, and all this time and they find the body and, and you know, they still to this day don't know who did it. But they found her body and they did the funeral and all this kind of thing. Now, here's the thing. The father ended up dying in 2007 due to alcohol... Uh, addiction related diseases in fact as you read the bio about it after her death and after the funeral the father 
had a hard time even finding work because he was so depressed and he was so into alcohol and trying to drown his sorrows and trying to numb his pain that he couldn't even really work and ended up dying in 2007. Her mom, on the other hand, became angry that somebody could do this and get away with it. And she began to petition and she began to work and grassroots organization and she got with other people and they formed the Amber Alert and she got it to where it went from just being a local thing to where it became national and what it is today and even today she is still working towards uh, trying to help uh, authorities make it easier for them to find abducted children now here's the thing the same thing happened to both of them they both lost their daughter in a tragic horrible way a, a parent's nightmare they both lost their daughter because a man came uh, we're assuming it was a man came and took her and killed her and he got away with it scot-free nobody has any clue who it was that did it he went to a bottle and ended up dying she put on the gloves and ended up fighting. Her response was different even though the event was the same. And I've, I just have to tell you, church, that we all have these times where we go through difficulties and we go through problems and we all have a past and we all have uh, things in our life that we can say... It, it was a hard life because of this or it was a hard life because of that or you know we struggle because of money or we struggle because my parents got divorced or we struggle because my dad beat on my mom or whatever it was you know there's all sorts of things that we can pull up in our past that we can make as excuses for why we don't serve God but it's not an excuse all it is is an obstacle because it's your choice whether you're going to give your everything to God or not it's your choice whether you're going to serve him or you're going to walk away away from him it's your choice it's, it has nothing to do with what your background is this woman Rahab this harlot heroine she was not raised in church she did not know God she didn't have parents that sang Jesus loves me to that to her she didn't have anybody making sure that she was on the straight and narrow path as a matter of fact she ended up having to just make it happen the best way she could by selling herself and she ended up taking a path that nobody wants to take but sometimes it seems like it's the only path to take and yet in spite of all of that in spite of being the she was you know actually with the ones that that seemed like the Goliath to David you know it was Israel that was the underdog even though all these stories and stuff look at the walls of this city this is our place we are defending this city and they you know they're not going to be able to get in here we're too strong and we're going to destroy them all these things that were going against her and yet the words of what God had done the stories of what God had done were enough to stir her faith to where she said I believe because she even said in verse uh, we see in verse 11 where she says and as soon as we heard these things our hearts did melt neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you and then what did she say for the Lord your God he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath she even said look he's not my God he's your God but I recognize that he is God think about the Israelites that were making the golden calf while Moses Moses was on the mountain just because Moses was up there too long and so even though they had seen all these things you know what we need a God that we can touch that we can feel that we can see let's go ahead and make a golden calf and we'll just kind of do our own thing you know we've got church people that have been raised in church and they don't have the kind of faith that Rahab had and Rahab had never encountered God do you understand that Rahab had never encountered the God she was confessing and professing was God all she had heard were stories, but it stirred her heart. What about us? And I don't know how much further into my actual lesson I'm going to get here because I just feel like we're going, we need to go in a different direction. What about us? I can't tell you a time where I have missed more than three Sundays in a row of church in my entire life. Maybe when we were moving from one state to another, um, it, because even during COVID, 
When I was pastoring in Coward, I was still doing a, a sermon every single service. I mean, I, you know, every Sunday morning, every Wednesday night, I was still doing a sermon. The times that we've had to not have service here because of COVID, I've still got up, even though I was very sick and I didn't realize it, I still got up and I was preaching and, and giving, delivering a sermon. So I, I could tell you, they're probably, I don't know, in over 51 years if I've had three Sundays where I've been out of church, all I've ever known is church. All I've ever known is God. All I've ever known is Pentecost. And I'm grateful for that. I'm not saying that in a bragging way. I'm, I'm saying that, that I'm grateful. And yet, I'm ashamed by the number of times that I have had doubt. The number of times that I have thought, I just, I don't think God can do it. Or, well, no, I don't want to word it that way because that's not a church way to word it. We know God can do anything. I just don't think he's going to. Well, that's the same thing. If you don't think he's going to, you're saying, I don't think he can. Now, it's fine to say, I don't know what God is going to do, but I know he's going to do something. That's a whole different story. You know, we can't dictate to God how he's going to move and how he's going to respond to situations. We can't dictate whether he's going to raise this one up or allow this one to go home. We can't dictate that, but we know that God is going to do something. But when I think about the n- number of hours that I have spent in church. And when I think about the number of hours that I have spent worrying about the future, as if I was doing it all by myself, I get ashamed. I'll just, I'll just be honest with you. When I think about the number of hours, the number of days, the amount of time that people that have called themselves Christians and have said they've been Christians their whole lives and been church members and all that kind of thing. And the number of sermons they've heard, the amount of the word that they have heard, the number of stories they've heard of God's goodness and, and the things that he has done, the testimonies that they have heard, uh, just ringing in our ears of how wonderful God is. And yet they can't put themselves in a place of commitment. There's too many other things that are more important. This woman could have easily said, you know what, I'm going to hide you. I'm going to hide you. Come on, let's go this way. And as soon as she stepped outside, she could have yelled for a guard, and they would have come, and they probably would have given her treasure for turning in these spies, and she would have been just the hero to everybody, and everybody would have thought that she was great and wonderful. But she heard about God and about what God did. She heard about how God was there for his people. She heard about a God who is not like the gods that they serve in, in, in Jericho where they, they'll dance and they'll gyrate and they'll sacrifice and they'll do all these horrible, disgusting things around this God to try to please the God and the God doesn't even care, doesn't even do anything. It wasn't like that. This was a people that God actually moved waters out of the way He actually caused the sun to stand still in the sky so that they could have victory. This is a God that provided food for them in the middle of a wilderness. It provided water that came from a rock. This is a God who actually did something. And it was enough to convince her that this is the God in heaven and beneath the earth and all in between. And yet here we are. We've got an entire book. Like I said, I'm probably not even going to get to the rest of what I was going to be saying. But we've got an entire book here of the goodness of God. We've got an entire book here that says what God has done for his people. And what God wants to do for his people. And we make it a coffee table item. We make it a for show item that we bring into church that everybody sees it. Knowing good and well that we're going to put it down like we put down our purse or our wallet or or junk mail or whatever. We're going to just put it down someplace until it's the next time to go to church. And we're not going to even crack the binding. We're not going to flip through the pages. We're not going to read what God is wanting to do. How many of you that either were here for Women's Day or you got to see it on the video where they did the song with the cardboard testimonies, where the the ladies that came up and filled the altar area saying, this is what I was going through, but this is what God did. 
How many of you were moved by that? Listen, I was up here and I was crying. And I was trying to choke it back and, and you know, trying to keep my composure because I'm on the front row and I'm snotting and tearing up in front of people. You know, I don't know. I may have snotted on Miss Millie or something. I don't know. She didn't say anything, thank God. But uh, I can't tell you the number of people that have mentioned to me just seeing it written down, the testimonies. And seeing the people standing there in person saying, this is what God did. And the way that it moved my heart. God, would you move our hearts again for what you're doing and what you've done in your word, what you're doing in our hearts, what you're doing in our church, what you're doing in in this nation, what you're trying to do in this world. God, would you move us? And church, would you let yourself get moved? Rahab could have heard these stories and said, ah, that's just exaggeration. It's just fairy tales. They're just trying to make something out of nothing. But it moved her so much that she committed treason against her people. And then she did something else. Because the next verses, and I'm not going to read them, I'm not going to read them right from the word, but the next verses, she's saying, now, I need you to do something for me here. I'm going to hide you. I'm going to get you out of here safe, but I need you to do something for me. When you guys come and destroy the city, see, for her, it was a foregone conclusion. It wasn't a matter of, you know, if you guys get lucky and you happen to, you know, uh, get a a few good shots in and, and we surrender or something. She said, when you guys come to take this city by the power of your God, please leave me alive and my my mom and my dad and my brothers and my sisters and all my household please just let us live please uh, that's all i'm asking is just just let us live god did so much more than that because the those men that went they said well look as long as you keep our secret and you don't tell anybody we were here we're good now you've got to understand it when we get here and we're fighting anybody that comes out of the house into the street they're getting killed and that won't be on us But we promise you, we're not going to come into your house. We're not going to kill anybody. You're going to put this scarlet thread out your window, and we're not going to kill anybody that is in this house. But as long as you keep our secret, and as long as you keep everybody in the house, you're going to be safe. You're going to be protected. You'll be all right. You know what she did? As soon as the men climbed out of her window and left, what did she do? She hung up the scarlet thread. She was ready because she didn't know when they were coming, but she knew they were coming back. And she knew they were coming and they were going to take the city. There was no doubt in her mind that they were coming and they were going to conquer and they were going to take the city because look at what their God already did. And all she wanted was just don't kill us. But what did God do? God allowed her to come into the lineage of Jesus Christ himself. Because when you read Matthew chapter 1, And you see that she married a man. And she gave birth to a man by the name of Boaz. And Boaz married a woman by the name of Ruth. And you begin to trace down Ruth's genealogy. Well, then here comes a man who served as king over all of Israel by the name of David. And as we continue down with the the genealogy, we continue down with the lineage, you see that there was an even greater king that came from her offspring, that came from her line, a woman who was a harlot, a woman who was a nobody, a woman who who was not even even a woman of God, a woman who uh, she had lived a life that was so disgusting. She had lived a life that we would look at her now and say she doesn't even need to come into our sanctuary because we don't want her to sully it. She lived that kind of a life, and yet God said, I'm going to put you right in the family right in the lineage of my son Jesus Christ when he is is born on this earth and he lives and he preaches and he goes and he uh, goes to the cross and gives himself on Calvary for the remission of all sin you are going to be in that lineage what an amazing honor you want to talk about name dropping you want to talk about name dropping imagine Rahab being up in heaven going yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm related to Jesus. He's my great, 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 great grandson, or whatever it is. You know, yeah, yeah. You know, David. Oh, yeah, he's, yeah, he's one of mine. He's one of mine. He's, he's right there. Yeah, that was me. That was me. Oh, Rahab. 
I mean, Lord, we name drop. <laughs> we'll name drop with the local celebrities. Well, I know the cousin of the guy who went to school with the weatherman from Channel 5. We're like this. You know, people, uh, people have name dropped with, well, I, you know what, I'm going to go in, on a tangent. I don't want to do that. Let me back up. I'll talk to you some other time about all the name droppers I know. But this is a woman who had nothing going for her as far as God was concerned. She had no guarantee that those men would live up to their word. I mean, think about the chaos of battle. The Israelites had just walked around Jericho seven times in that one day. And then they shouted with a great shout of victory. And then after that shout of victory, the walls fell down flat. And chaos ensued. And the Israelites went in and just began to slice and dice everybody that they could find. How easy would it have been for some soldier pumped up on adrenaline to go into Rahab's house and to destroy her and her family. She had no guarantee that they were going to keep their promise. She was guaranteed that death, if the king ever found out what she did. But there was something about the stories of their God that so compelled her, that so moved her, that she had to respond. She had to respond. She said, the Lord, your God. She was admitting, I don't know him. I don't serve him. But I'll tell you this, your God, he is God in heaven and the earth and beneath the earth. He is the God of all. There is no question. He is the God that strikes fear in the enemy's heart just at his name. He is the God that is faced with an obstacle like the Red Sea. And just with the, the breath uh, coming from him, he blows the waves this way and that way and dries the land and allows his people to go forward. He is a God that from what I have heard, that in the middle of the wilderness, there became something like a heavenly bread that, that you had no explanation for. Nobody had baked it. Nobody could have made it. And it, it was just, it was almost magical and it just appeared but it filled your bellies and gave you what you needed and then when you weren't satisfied God sent you quail so you could have meat and it was so much quail that I mean you couldn't even eat it all you were getting sick of all the meat that you were getting while other people are starving and you're just complaining because you've got too much boy doesn't that sound like the modern church and I don't know this God but he is God. I just wonder what the spies thought when she said that, when she made that proclamation. Because you see, those spies, I mean, they, they weren't there for the Red Sea because they were in the wilderness for 40 years. And so, you know, uh, all the ones that were, were doubting and, you know, over that 40 years, you know, that whole generation was just kind of wiped out. And there were other ones that were coming up. So it's very probable that they didn't know about, they didn't see the Red Sea themselves, but they did see what God did in the wilderness. They did see how God gave them victory in the different battles. They did see how God helped them to be victorious when it seemed like that they should have been defeated. They knew that. And I just wonder if when they heard this woman declare, this woman who probably still had the stink of, of perfume on her, trying to attract customers, maybe still had sweat on her brow from work she had done, a woman that everyone in the city knew but nobody wanted to admit that they knew who she was. A woman who would, in their society, would have been put in a pit and stoned to death. And here she is. She's never been to a service, never been to church. She's never sacrificed a goat or a cow or a bird or anything like that. She's, she hasn't 
seen the Ark of the Covenant, that majestic chest where the very glory of God would sit on it in the Holy of Holies. And yet, she has more fear and reverence of God than we do. Church, let me tell you, like I said, this isn't the direction I had planned on going, but let me tell you this. If anybody needs to be declaring that God is God, that he is Lord over all. That he is Lord of the heavens and the earth and beneath the earth. That he is the creator of all things. That there is nothing that has ever been created that has ever been made that was not made by him. If anybody should be making those proclamations, it should be us. And not just when we get in the sanctuary. Not just when we're singing a song. Not just when we're singing how great is our God. But if anybody should be outside declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord, it needs to be those of us who have experienced his forgiveness and his grace and his mercy. Rahab knew nothing of God but stories she had heard, and yet her faith, her faith is, because, is why we know who she is today. My friend, I don't know where you are in your relationship with Christ. I come in here and I know that, you know, there's, all, there's always, especially on Sundays, there's always going to be a situation where, you know, there may be somebody in the sanctuary that doesn't know him and, and wants to give their life to Christ. And so that's why I try to make it uh, available to them, you know, to receive Jesus Christ on that day. And, you know, most of the time when I give a salvation call, nobody comes up because most of us are already saved or we think we are. But I just challenge you to look at yourself. To look at yourself and to say, do I have Rahab faith? Do I have Rahab faith? Because I can tell you right now, that's something I'm having to work on. I thought I was a man of faith, and I, I still think I am a man of faith. And I, I, I do believe that God can do anything. But I've got to admit that when you get into the thick of it, when you're right there in the middle of the storm, sometimes it's hard to see beyond your own problem. And I get that. That's humanity. So don't think that I'm coming down on you if you're that way. Because your pastor is that way sometimes too. But Lord... Would you give me the faith of Rahab to where you don't even have to do anything for me. I just have to hear about who you are and then I'm ready to declare you Lord and God. Lord, would you give me the faith of Rahab where I'm willing to put myself in a place where it may be very bad for me. It may turn out really bad for me. But yet I'm going to stand firm and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord. Even if I don't feel him. Even if, if I'm not feeling saved. Even if I'm not feeling a move of God. Lord, let me be one that's going to worship you anyway. We need to pray that, church. We need to seek God about that, church. We need to get off of this thing of all right, God, what have you done for me lately? God, you want me to worship? You better give me a good week. All right, I'm going to be at church on Sunday. But they, they better play the right music, and he better preach the right sermon, and, and you better have put me in a good mood on Sunday morning if you expect any praise out of me. Let me just tell you, he's worthy of your praise whether you've had a good week or not. He's worthy of your praise, whether we sing your favorite song or we sing a song that just makes you want to plug your ears. He's worthy of praise if I preach for 10 minutes or I preach for an hour and a half. Hello. And I know it's almost past time. But you hush up, Kenny. I'm kidding.
Lord, I just ask right now in the name of Jesus. Father, this, this lesson, this message is not at all what I expected it was going to be. And yet I know that what I've spoken, Lord, has come from the Holy Spirit. Lord, I ask you to forgive me for the times that I have doubted just because I was going through a difficult time, the times when I've wanted to surrender just because things weren't going my way, the times that I have, have wanted to wave a white flag just because somebody hurt my feelings. Lord, forgive me. Because in those times, I'm making bad choices. I'm making a bad response. God, help my response to be a Rahab response. Lord, where you don't have to prove anything to me because you've already proven it time and time and time and time again. Lord, where even if I don't have a testimony to give right now, Lord, I can just look at the testimonies of others and I can see the greatness of God. Lord, if I can just get to that place where I can worship you even when I don't feel like worshiping, even when I don't feel like praising, where I can pray even though I don't feel like praying, God, simply because you are God, not because you, uh, I now feel like you have earned it, I now feel like that it's the right time. Lord, it's always the right time because you are always is worthy and I pray father that you will help us as a church to come to a place where our worship and our praise and our prayer and our dedication to you is not contingent upon what you have done for us but simply because of who you are because you are worthy Lord if I never receive another blessing God you're worthy of my praise God, if, if, I never, if I never have another healing take place in my body or in the body of a loved one, Lord, you are still worthy of praise because you're still a healer. God, if, if, if I am struggling and, and I just don't know which way to turn, Lord, and I'm confused, Lord, you're still worthy of praise because even though I may be confused, you are not the author of confusion. And instead, you are the light and you are the way. God, give us that attitude in this church. Lord, we want it in the whole church universal, but God, let it start at Oak Grove. And let us have an attitude, Father, that we are going to worship you and we're going to praise you simply because of who you are, because of the things that we have heard. And I give you praise, honor, and glory, and power in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I, uh, I'll leave you with this. I went through this period of time where it seemed like every pastor that I heard preach was talking about how they went to the mailbox and somebody had sent them a $2,000 check out of the blue. Or somebody had sent them $5,000 out of the blue. A preacher said, oh yeah, I've Probably nine or ten times in the past year I've gone in the mailbox and there was money in the mailbox that came from a source that I wasn't expecting. And I was like, Lord, were some of those misaddressed by chance? Because I haven't gotten mine yet. And here's what's interesting. I remember one Sunday I heard somebody say that. And my first response, my reaction was, <sighs> Well, where's mine? And the Lord convicted me so hard about that that I went to the altar. I, wasn't, I was on staff. I wasn't pastoring. I went to the altar that day, and I prayed, and I said, Lord, you just got to forgive me. I'm sorry. I don't know where that came from. That is my own woe is me kind of attitude, and, and Lord, that isn't right. Thank you for blessing them. I, I know that you're going to bless me when the time is right. Thank you for blessing them, Lord. And, and I just, if I never get anything, that's fine because you provide my every need. Uh, you know, I, I may not have a whole lot left over, but, uh, you know, I've not missed a meal, that's for sure. You know, and, and I, I just, I mean, I prayed and I was, I felt about this tall. And the next day, there was a check in the mail for me for $50. Not 2000 
not $3,000, but $50 from a woman that I used to go to church with when I was a kid. And she said that the Lord had laid me on her heart and that she just wanted to bless me and she hopes that this is a great blessing to me. And I looked at that check for $50. And you know what I said? I said, well, thank you, Jesus. It's finally begun. Now, I'm pretty sure that's the last one I've gotten. But, no, there have been so many other times where the Lord is just just out of the blue, just laid it on somebody's heart. We want to bless you. There, there was a time I, I didn't have a vehicle and I didn't know how I was going to get back forth to work and all that kind of thing. And a guy had asked me if I could uh, get a ride over to his house. And so I did. And my dad took me there and he said, well, listen, I had forgotten to give you uh, this gift. So here you go. And he gave me the keys to his truck. And it was an old truck, but it was a truck and it was in decent condition. At the time, I took care of that. But it was in decent condition, and he said, he said, but I'm not just going to give it to you. I'm going to sell it to you for $20. And I was like, you're going to sell me a truck for $20? I think I can handle that. He said, absolutely. Oh, by the way, I forgot to give this to you. Uh, somebody had handed that to me to give to you, and it was a $20 bill. And, and he put it in my pocket, and I reached out and went like that. And he goes, oh, thank you. And he took the 20 back, put it in his pocket, and signed the title over to me. God provided in a way that I did not expect him to provide. But you know what? Even if he never did any of those things, he's still worthy to be praised. Even if he never, ever, ever did anything like that, where out of the blue there was just a blessing, where out of the blue somebody just came and, and gave us chocolate covered strawberries or we're out of the blue somebody just wrote us a check now I've already gotten the chocolate covered strawberries today so if anybody wants to write a check no I'm kidding I'm kidding but if God if that never happened to us the praise he's worthy of is not contingent upon my satisfaction level this is not a, a Yelp review our praise shouldn't be a well I'll give you three stars for this week God you know it wasn't a bad week but it could have been better He's worthy of all our praise. Amen? I'll probably talk some more about Rahab next week and actually talk to you about what I was planning on talking to you about. But anyway, uh, but we are late for Brother Kenny to get home, so let's go ahead and we'll dismiss uh, at this time. Thank you very much for being here tonight, and uh, I just pray that the Lord will bless you. Uh, please don't forget about the announcements. Please do forget about the things I was supposed to keep quiet and keep secret. Please just act like that never happened, and you can delete that part of the video. That would be wonderful. Don't forget to check out our YouTube channel that we've got now, and you can see all the videos that we've got posted. Father, we thank you for all that you've given us. We ask you to go with us as we leave this place tonight. Let us walk in your favor and your blessings, but let us mostly, Lord, walk in praise unto you, Father. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. Shake some hands. Tell somebody you love them.